This week we are going to talk about cause effect essays. Cause effect essays are one kind of exposition essay. So the structure is very similar. You would have an introduction, a main body, and a conclusion. The introduction and the conclusion are the same as for the exposition essay, so I won't repeat myself. The main body where you should explain what your topic is, um, you have three different ways to write a cause effect essay. You can choose a situation, event, phenomenon, xianxiang, and you can either explain how this situation came about, what are the causes, you can explain what this situation might lead to, what are the effects, or you can do both. You can talk about the causes and the effects of this situation. Um, so it's called cause effect, but you don't have to focus equally on both causes and effects. Uh, depending on your topic, keep on going, Depending on your topic, maybe your reader might want to know more about how this situation developed. Maybe your reader will want to know what will this situation cause in the future. And maybe your topic is so unusual and new and special that your reader wants to know everything about this topic. So depending on what topic you choose, you can focus on cause, effect, or both. So that's the theoretical introduction. Do you have questions? OK, so today we're going to look at two example essays in the textbook. The first essay is on page 65. The Irish potato famine. Famine is when people don't have enough food. Ji Huang. Throughout much of its history, the United States has welcomed immigrants to its shores. People have come because of opportunity, political liberty, and religious freedom. Others have come because of oppression and poverty in their native countries. There is no greater example of the latter reason for immigration than the Irish who fled to this country during the Great Potato Famine of 1845 through 1851. They came because of their failed crops and their resulting starvation, the loss of their homes and possessions to their indifferent landlords, and the ineffectiveness of the English and Irish governments to help them survive. So the introduction tells us everything we need to know about this essay. The second sentence gives us some reasons why people move to the United States. These uh, are positive reasons. These are things that people want to find in the United States. The third sentence gives us negative reasons. Uh, these are reasons why people want to leave their original home to come to the United States. And then the fourth sentence says that we're going to be talking about the latter. We're going to be talking about negative reasons. And this is the main topic of this essay. The, uh, how the Great Potato Famine of 1845 to 1851 brought Irish people to the United States. So this is history, right? We're talking about a historical event. Um, history is a popular choice for cause effect essays, right? History is basically all cause and effect, but you don't have to do history. You can talk about something in your personal life. Uh, you can talk about something in pop culture. It's your choice. 
But this essay will be talking about the Great Potato Famine of 1845 to 1851. The next sentence tells us the three main points that this essay will talk about. Failed crops and starvation, so there's not enough food growing. Losing homes and things because their landlords don't care. Uh, landlords are people who own the land, Diju. And because the governments are ineffective. Uh, at this point, Ireland was ruled by England. It was England's first colony. Um, so when it says English and Irish governments, it's the same government. So this tells us that this essay will be about the many different causes of one thing. Uh, Irish immigration due to the Great Potato Famine. The conditions under which the majority of the 8 million Irish lived were shocking. There never was, the Duke of Wellington wrote, a country in which poverty existed to the extent it exists in Ireland. A census in 1841 reported nearly half of the rural population is living in the lowest state. People were crammed inside one room mud cabins without windows or furniture. Farmers slept with their pigs in filthy conditions. Homeless people put roofs over ditches or slept in tunnels they dug in the ground. So for this paragraph, the main idea is in the first sentence. So many Irish people were very, very poor. To explain this idea, first we have a quotation from an expert of the time, the Duke of Wellington. Then you have data from a census. A census is a survey of the people, uh, And then you have a description of different ways that poor people lived. And then you have this, Woodham Smith 20. This is called a citation. It tells us that the information in this paragraph came from somewhere else. Uh, and at the end of the essay, there is a list of sources of information. And so if you look at the list of sources on page 67, um, the PowerPoint forgot to include the list, so I can't show you. But if you look on in your textbook on page 67, there's a list of sources and the fourth source says. Woodham Smith Cecil, the great hunger. So this tells us that the source is a book called the great hunger by some guy named Cecil Woodham Smith. And the number is a page number. So if the reader wants to find the original information, they can look at the name, go to the list at the end, find the title of the book, find the book, and then go to this page, and they will find this information. When you write an essay, you don't have to think about everything yourself. Right? You can use information from other places. But remember to add a citation to tell me that this is not your idea, that you found this somewhere else. And so uh, if I follow your citation, I should be able to find that information also. Um, I also want you to pay attention to these quotations. The Duke of Wellington writes this sentence. There never was a country in which poverty, blah, blah, blah. Um, the point is that this is one complete sentence quotation. And the part that says this is the person who said it is shoved in the middle. 
when you have this kind of sentence, you should separate the quotation from the person using commas. So there's one comma here. And there's one comma here. This tells the reader that the middle part between the two commas is not part of the quotation. It's telling us who said this. Also note that at the end of the quotation, the period goes inside the quotation mark. In American English, if your quotation ends with a period or a comma, it goes inside the quotation mark. If it ends with any other kind of punctuation mark, question mark, exclamation point, jing tan hao, colon, mao hao, semicolon, fen hao, all of those you have to think. Does this mark belong with the quotation? Or is it part of the longer sentence? If it belongs with the quotation, then it goes inside the quotation mark. If it belongs with the bigger sentence outside of the quotation, it goes outside the quotation mark. The next sentence also uses quotation marks. This is the complete quotation. Uh, and then this is where we find the quotation. So you separate these two with a comma. Now, remember I said that this is one complete sentence in the quotation. Sometimes you will see somebody uh, saying a quotation that is more than one sentence. Uh, and you might want to put like the Duke of Wellington wrote that part between the two sentences. If you put the person in the middle of the quotation between two complete sentences, then the second comma should be a period. And the beginning of the second sentence in the quotation should begin with a capital letter. Uh, we'll practice this a bit later today. So this paragraph is about how poor the people of Ireland are. All this misery could be traced to absentee English and wealthy Irish landlords. So these are landlords who don't live on their land. An 1845 report stated that their property was merely a source from which to extract as much money as possible. Landlords leased their land to others who divided it so they could collect more rent. The Irish tenants, the people living on the land, paid for the right to farm it and to put a cabin up on the property quickly. No money was exchanged, however. The payments were measured by the number of days the tenants worked. So this paragraph explains the land rental system of that time. And the interesting thing is that Irish people did not pay money for rent. Instead, they worked for their landlord. So maybe like uh, part of what they grow, they would have to give to their landlord as rent instead of money. This arrangement depended entirely and exclusively on the potato. It grew easily in the bad soil and was easy to cook. The potato was also perfect for feeding pigs cattle and chickens. The crop, however, would rot soon after harvesting and could not be stored between growing seasons. By 1840, one third of the Irish population depended entirely on the potato for food. 
It was a dependency that teetered on the brink of starvation and created a time bomb and needed only the slightest spark to explode. So this paragraph, as it says in the first sentence, explains the importance of the potato. Uh, and it gives many advantages of growing potatoes. Grows easily, cooks easily, you can feed your animals. The one disadvantage is that it goes bad quickly, so you can't keep it for very long. And then it tells us that most Irish people depended entirely on the potato for food. So this could be a problem, right? What if one year, for some reason, there aren't enough potatoes? You don't have enough potatoes from last year because they all went bad. Where would these Irish people get food to eat? So the, these three paragraphs from two to four are preparing us to understand why the Irish potato famine happened and why it was so serious. First, you have the idea that everyone is poor. Uh, and so instead of paying with money, they pay their rent with what they grow, and they grow potatoes. So if the potatoes go bad, the whole system falls apart. So once we have this necessary information, we can finally begin talking about what happened in 1845 to 1851. That spark exploded in 1845 when the potato crop was attacked by a fungus, xunlei, like mushrooms or something. The leaseholders, the farmers, dug the potatoes up only to find that they had turned into a dark, gooey mess. Six months later, the famine began. It continued and grew worse virtually every year until 1850. That's pretty serious, right? If your potatoes cannot last until the next year, this is five years without potatoes, without food. So this is the beginning of the famine. At first, the British government tried to help by importing Indian corn from the United States. Uh, here, the word Indian does not mean from India. Indian means Native American. However, the corn made many people ill, and most tenants had to sell or pawn all their possessions to pay for it. To pawn means to sell temporarily, and later when you have money, you can buy it back. Dian Tang. So the government tries to help by letting people buy corn, but the people can't eat the corn and it costs them money when they already don't have money. So it's not a very good plan. Then the government initiated a second plan, hiring the farm laborers to build roads and canals. Canals are waterways, chu dao. By December of 1846, half a million men were breaking rocks up into pieces and shoveling dirt. At this point, however, some workers died of starvation before receiving their wages. So they were so hungry that they worked and worked, but before they got paid, they died of their hunger. So remember at the beginning, the essay told us what we're going to read about. Failed crops and starvation. We talked about that. Lo uh, loss of homes and possessions. We haven't seen this yet. Ineffectiveness of the government. We just saw this. So we're currently two out of three. The famine worsened in 1846 when disease struck the potato crop again. 
So already 1845, no potatoes. 1846, no potatoes. A stranger, wrote a sub-inspector of police from County Cork, would wonder how these wretched beings find food. They sleep in their rags and have pawned their bedding. Unfortunately, much of the food they found was the seed potatoes for next year's crop. As a result, when the 1847 harvest came in free of disease, it was too small to feed everyone. So 45, no potatoes, 46, no potatoes, 47, healthy potatoes, but not enough. Because people were eating the potato seeds, they were so hungry. In 1848, the situation worsened as the blight came back, destroying the entire crop. A blight is a disease for plants. So 45 sick potatoes, 46 sick potatoes, 47 not enough potatoes, 48 sick potatoes. By this time, even the landlords became desperate. They threw out half a million tenants who could not pay their rent through labor and then burned their homes. Why would the landlords burn the homes? Because they didn't want the farmers to secretly move back in. Consequently, many went to live in poor houses. In 1847, however, all public work projects ended and public poor houses were closed. Now with the tenants homeless and living in filth, typhoid fever, cholera, and dysentery broke out. These are all diseases. Claiming more lives than starvation itself. An official estimate claimed that 750,000 people died from the famine and related causes, but the true number may have been twice as many. So this is the third point. The landlords just did not care, and they kicked out poor farmers and just didn't care about them. As a result, so we've talked about our three main reasons. So here is the effect of those causes. As a result, a million Irish poor fled the country, most of them heading by boat across the Atlantic. The conditions on these coffin ships were horrifying, and many people died during the journey. Of those who survived, the great majority went to Quebec and Montreal, Canada. But after arriving, over half walked across the border to the United States. They wanted no part of living in Canada, a British colony. Um, so the effect is that so many Irish people moved to North America and then went to the United States. Uh, I want you to pay attention to this. Coffin ships. A coffin is the box you put a dead body in. Guan Cai. Notice it uses quotation marks, but we don't know who is talking. We don't have a source here. We have a general source for the entire paragraph later, but we're not sure where these words come from. And this is because this is not a quotation. In English, you can use quotation marks for two things. One, quotations, and the other use is this. It tells us that these words are used with a special meaning. So for example, if we see the words coffin ships without quotation marks, we might think that these are ships with empty coffins that they are going to sell or something. But by adding the quotation marks, it tells us that there is a special meaning and we should expect uh, an explanation of this meaning later. Indeed, we do get an explanation. Many people died during the journey. 
Ah, so that's why it's called coffin ships because so many people died on these ships. So that's the second use of quotation marks in English. So we've talked about the three main reasons. We talked about the effect. Paragraph 10 is therefore probably the conclusion. The Irish viewed the rapidly growing United States as a land of opportunity. These poor immigrants showed up in rags without money, education, or skill, but they had a small glimmer of hope. Over the last nearly two centuries, that hope has been fully realized. Aha! Present tense, 现在是, right? It all used to be past tense, right? Died, went, walked, showed up, but here has been is present tense. So we have gone from the past to the present. In other words, we are moving toward the future, which is what your conclusion is supposed to do. It's supposed to move into the future. So this indeed is the conclusion. The Irish population of the United States has more than doubled that of all of Ireland. And an Irish American was even elected to the most powerful position in the United States. John Fitzgerald Kennedy became the first Irish American president in 1961. So this essay is one example of how to write an essay about many causes for one effect. The effect is many Irish people moved to the United States because of a potato famine. And the causes of the potato famine, the essay gives us three. Failed crops, losing homes because of uh, landlords who don't care, and ineffective governments. But before it starts explaining these three causes, it has to let us understand why these causes are so serious. So paragraph two talks about the general poverty of Ireland at that time. Paragraph three talks about the economic system between farmers and landlords. And paragraph four talks about the importance of the potato. That way, when in paragraph five, it begins talking about failing potatoes, we understand how serious it is. If the potatoes all fail and Irish people don't have enough money or like crops or labor to pay their rent because they're poor, landlords kick them out, the government cannot help them, there's no way for Irish people to survive, and so they do the only thing they can, which is they move to North America. So paragraph five begins talking about the potato famine. Paragraph six talks about the ineffective government plan. Paragraph seven talks about how this situation became more and more serious every year. Because like if it was only one year and the government didn't do a good job, like it's bad, but at least people will have more food the next year. But no, for Ireland, it's four straight years of no food. And then paragraph eight talks about how the landlords uh, also made the situation worse. So with the three main causes explained, uh, paragraph nine can explain the effect, which is people move to the United States and North America. And then paragraph 10 is your conclusion. Do you have questions about this essay? OK, um, let's look at page 68. Our textbook has a second example essay for us. The explosive growth of cities. By the end of the 19th century, OK, so it's another history essay. 
immigrants from southern and eastern Europe crowded into cities that were already heavily populated by native born Americans. As a result, the cities suffered greatly from the effects of rapid growth. Sanitation, which means public health. Fire protection and the paving of streets, so turning dirt streets into like concrete streets. Were inadequate. Housing was insufficient and overcrowded. Families fell apart and crime grew out of control. Because of the extent of these problems, however, people eventually took steps to improve living conditions. So again, the first paragraph tells us what kind of essay we're going to read. It's about a historical situation. The cause is more and more people moving into cities in the United States. And here it says mainly because they moved here from southern and eastern Europe. And then it gives us many different effects. So it looks like this essay is one cause, many effects. And it gives us three main effects. Sanitation, fire protection, paving of streets, one. Housing and crowding, two. And uh, social problems, right? Families fall apart, crime out of control, three. So we can expect to read about these three effects. Uh, and then it says that because of these problems, people try to improve the situation. So maybe these three effects are also causes of another further effect, people wanting to try to solve these problems. Sewer and water facilities could not keep pace with the rapidly increasing needs. A sewer is where you let out your dirty water. So this is about sanitation, public health. By the 1890s, the tremendous growth of Chicago had put such a strain on the sanitation system that the Chicago River had become virtually an open sewer. The city's drinking water contained such a high concentration of germ killing chemicals that it was almost undrinkable. In the 1880s, all the sewers of Baltimore emptied into the Back River Basin. According to the journalist H. L. Mencken, every summer smelled like a billion polecats. Um, polecat means uh, skunk. It's an old word for skunk, and a skunk is uh, a stinky animal. Cho yo. I don't know what's a good way to explain skunks. A, a stinky squirrel. Something like that. So that's the public health and sanitation part. Then fire protection became less and less adequate. So that's the that's the fire protection part. I would say a bit more about this, but the essay only gives us one sentence. Garbage piled up on the streets faster than workers could carry it away. The streets themselves crumbled beneath the pounding of heavy traffic. Urban growth proceeded with such speed that the cities laid out new streets much more rapidly than they could be paved. Chicago had more than 1400 miles of dirt streets in 1890. So this paragraph is the first effect. Sanitation, ooh, ke uh, yidong Sanitation, public health, fire protection, and the streets are all dirt streets are not paved. The population explosion also placed a great strain on the housing supply. So this is the second thing, right? Not enough houses. People poured into the great cities faster than houses and apartments could be built for them. As a result, 
the densely packed areas of the 1840s became unbearable. Greedy builders used every foot of space, squeezing out light and air in order to jam in a few additional family units. Substandard living quarters aggravated other evils, such as the breakdown of family life, along with mental distress, crime, and juvenile delinquency. Uh, so this paragraph is about the social problems. Juvenile delinquency just means uh, young people who commit crimes. Ching Sonny and Fan Zui. Um, this paragraph does not really explain the relation between living in bad places and these like breaking down of family life, mental distress, crime. Um, but it's not too hard to understand. If you live in a in a place that's too small, then you can't spend all day with your family at home. You have to spend most of your day outdoors somewhere else. And so that leads to uh, more distance between family members. Family members are not so close. Mental distress, we can understand that. And crime, why would living in a poor place lead to crime? Well, first of all, if you don't have enough resources because there are too many people, that might lead to crime. But also, if you can't stay at home all day, and you're on the streets and you're bored, there's nothing to do, uh, you may start to want to seek thrills, uh, and that might lead to more crime, especially for young people. The bloody New York riots of 1863, for example, were caused in part by the bitterness and frustration of thousands jammed together. So the crowding was so serious that people started to go to the streets to riot. A citizens committee expressed amazement after visiting the slums that so much misery, disease, and wretchedness can be huddled together and hidden. So finally, somebody went to check what's actually going on. But this somebody is not the government. It's a citizens committee, which means a group of people who want to find out what's going on, not the government. So we've mentioned the three effects, right? Sanitation, fire protection, streets. Paragraph three is uh, over uh, housing and overcrowding. Paragraph four is social problems. And so maybe these three effects added together become a cause for another effect. Eventually, however, practical forces operated to bring about improvements. Once the relationship between polluted water and disease was fully understood, everyone saw the need for clean water and decent sewage systems. City dwellers of all classes resented the dirt, noise, and ugliness. In many communities, public spirited groups formed societies to plant trees, clean up littered areas, which means trash, and develop recreational facilities. When one city took on improvements, others tended to follow suit prompted by local pride and competition between cities. I, I want you to notice something. We've been talking about three effects, effect one, effect two, effect three. Every time these three are mentioned, they follow the same order, right? Sanitation, fire protection, streets, housing, and social problems, one, two, three. Right, this paragraph is sanitation, fire protection, streets. This paragraph is housing. This paragraph is social problems. Even when they talk about improvements, it follows the same order. Uh, sanitation, right? Water and disease. 
and then dirt, noise, and ugliness, which is from too many people living in the same place. And then uh, having more things to do and more places to go can help reduce crime from bored people. A recreational facility is a place you can go to spend time, like uh, play sports or, or like a library or uh, like uh, to go and have like tea and talk with people, that kind of thing. And when one city improves, other cities also improve because of local pride in their own city and competition between cities. So we've already talked about the main points mentioned in the introduction. Uh, so paragraph six is probably the conclusion. Let's see. Gradually, the basic facilities of urban living were improved. Streets were paved, first with stones and wood blocks, and then with smoother, quieter asphalt. Asphalt is blacktop bleaching. Gaslight, then electric arc lights, and finally Thomas Edison's incandescent lamps brighten the cities after dark. So when cities first used lights, they first used gaslight, uh, and then arc lights. Uh, I can't remember what arc lights are in Chinese, but the idea is between the two points, the air in the middle, uh, you use energy to fill the air in the middle and it gives off heat and light, but it takes a lot of energy. It's very wasteful. Uh, and then finally, you have Edison's light bulb. Uh, and of course, you don't heat the air, right? You heat a piece of metal between the two points. This illumination of the cities made law enforcement easier. So it's easier for cops to catch bad guys if they can see at night. It also stimulated nightlife and permitted factories and shops to operate after sunset. And so this also helps to reduce crime. If people have places to go, things to do, it, there's less crime. Life in the cities was far from ideal. But streetcars would take people quickly and inexpensively to work and back. And high rise buildings would soon fill the horizons. The modern American city was forming throughout the East and Midwest. Um, streetcars, these are not cars. These are more like trains. In Chinese, we call this jiechi. Uh, and then high rise buildings. These two help to solve the problem of not enough housing. Streetcars can let people live further away from the city center. So they have more space to build homes. And high rise buildings means you can fit more people on the same size of land. So the problems mentioned in the essay are or had been slowly solved. I also want you to notice this. Again, we move from the past tense, simple past tense, to a, a preiterate past tense, right? This is just simple, stimulated, but here it says would take. Would means that you're standing in the past looking at the future. So this is also pushing the reader into the future, which is what a conclusion should do, right? If it says will take, or in the next sentence, will soon fill, that's just future. But would take means you're in the past looking toward the future. Either way, it's. Uh, it pushes the reader to the future. So this is an example of a cause effect essay with one cause and many different effects. The cause is. Too many people moving into cities. The first main effect is public 
sanitation, fire, and streets. Second main effect is overcrowding and not enough housing. And the third main effect is social problems. These three effects come together to become a new cause that creates a further effect of people trying to solve these problems. Uh, and as people try to solve these problems, cities improve and we can slowly shift into the future. Do you have questions about this essay? OK, let's do a grammar practice. On page 78. Practice eight. This is about parallelism, pi b. Uh, parallelism means that when you have a list of things or you have a parallel sentence, the grammar should be the same. Uh, there are five mistakes related to parallelism in these two paragraphs. Uh, I'll show you the first one as practice. Um, each mistake, there is a hint. Uh, if you see italicized words, 斜体字, this is the first part of a parallel construction. So the mistake is probably in the second or third part. So for example, millions of Germans moved to the United States in the 1800s and brought, right, moved brought their language with them. So you have the same subject. And uh, two predicates, one is moved, blah, 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 and brought, blah, blah, blah. So these two should use the same grammar. There are four more places to correct. And um, we will compare answers after the break.
OK, let's compare answers. The next one is here. Teachers taught in German, published German language newspapers, and spoke German. And then the next one is here. At home, in stores, and in taverns. You don't need to add this extra stuff. The next one is here. Speaking English at home, but also speaking German when they visited their parents. Right, both are the same verb. And then the last one is here. The Japanese, the Italians, Eastern Europeans, and all of these are nouns. Noun, 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 so you don't need this. Many more. Also a noun. Questions? OK, let's do the next practice on page 82. Yeah, this one. It gives you a sentence with a quotation, but it doesn't tell you where the quotation begins, where the quotation ends, and whether it is a sentence or a question. So please add the correct punctuation to each sentence. And if you have to, change the first word in the quotation to a capital letter. So the first one is an example. Blah, 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 said. So uh, he said something. So the next word is the quotation. Uh, so you have a comma before the quotation. You have a quotation mark. And then you have a capital A because this is a complete sentence. Or two complete sentences. And then you have a period inside the quotation mark. So five questions, I'll give you 10 minutes. Do you need 10 minutes? Five minutes, five minutes should do.
OK, let's compare answers. So question two, where does the quotation begin? Here. Cautioned means warn to give a warning. So it's it's talking. So what does he say? Uh, so if the quotation begins here, comma. Quotation mark. It is best not to swap horses while crossing the river. Is this a complete sentence? Yes, so this should be a capital I. And then at the end, is it a question? No, so this is a period and then a quotation mark. Next one, where is the quotation? At the end, it says Lincoln also said, so it looks like everything before that is the quotation. So quotation mark. This is a comma. And the reason is because. It's the end of the quotation, but it's not the end of the sentence. The sentence still continues. So even though this should be a period, we are going to change it into a comma. Quotation mark. Blah, 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 period. Next one, where is the quotation? In the middle, it says Lincoln added. So it looks like everything else is the quotation. So the quotation is the ballot is much stronger than the bullet. So beginning of the quotation, comma. Sorry, not comma, quotation mark. Comma to separate quotation from non quotation. Uh, so comma quotation mark, blah, 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 comma, quotation mark. Is this a complete sentence? No, so you do not need a capital I. Blah, 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 is this a question? No, period, quotation mark. Ah, this one. Why should there not be a persistent confidence in the ultimate judgment of the people? Said Lincoln in his first inaugural address. Is there any better or equal hope in this world? So where is the quotation? It's everything except for these words. Said Lincoln in his first inaugural address. Everything else is a quotation. So. Quotation mark, blah, 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 blah. Is this a complete sentence up to people? Yes. Is it a question? Yes. So this is a question mark. Quotation mark. And it is a complete sentence, so this is a period. Quotation mark. Beginning of a new sentence, so it's capital I. Is there any better or equal hope in this world? Is this a question? Yes, so question mark. And then quotation mark. This one is harder because you have to notice that it's one quotation, but it's two complete sentences in the quotation. So when you put the Lincoln said blah, blah, blah in the middle of these two sentences, the first sentence has to end before the beginning of the second sentence in the quotation. Even though it's one quotation, it's two sentences. 
Last one. Mark Twain, the famous American author, once wrote, uh, wrote. So the next part should be the quotation. So comma, quotation mark, beginning of a new sentence. Or oh, we should talk about this. Always do right. This will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Is this a complete sentence? No, it's two complete sentences. Uh, so capital A. And then always do right is the first sentence, which means always do the right thing. Uh, so period. Capital T beginning of the new sentence. And then at the end, is this a question? No, period, quotation mark. There's a mistake. There should be a period here. Okay, do you have questions about these? Okay. So next week is a holiday. The week after that, we will have an individual conference. So this means you come here, I will give you your essays back, and then I will call your name one by one. And when I call your name, you will come here and we will talk about your essay. After the conference, you will have one week to finish your first essay and submit it to Moodle before class. Um, yes. And then midterm exam, no, no class, no exam either. For us and then before this class. You have to exchange your second essay with your group members and come to class to discuss your second essay. Uh, some of you have new group members or maybe I changed the composition of your group so you can go online and check to see if your group members have changed. I will remind you. Uh, during week eight. Now, because um, the next class is a conference, so if you have not yet handed in your essay, please hand in uh, your essay paper copy to my department office mailbox before fifth period, October 13. This is a Thursday. We have two weeks because of the holiday. Otherwise, there should be only one week of time. Where is my department office mailbox? There is a YouTube link on Moodle. Right, so now you know where my mailbox is. Now, if for some reason two weeks is not enough time and you miss this deadline, uh, first of all, you should try to hand in your essay as soon as possible. Don't wait for this deadline. Um, I have 60 essays to mark, so please hand in as soon as you can. But if you miss this deadline for some reason, then you can upload a uh, file dot sorry docx file only to this place. If you upload a file, I will mark your file, and then uh, I will upload it to this place. You guys are late afternoon exposition. After I mark your essay, it will be here. Now, 
uh, you have to download the essay because I will mark your essay using track changes. And if you don't know how to use track changes, I have a video here on Moodle. And the key point is you have to download. You have to download the file. And then after you download it, you can open the file. And you will you won't see anything. You have to go up there, turn on track changes, show all markings. And then you will see all of the things that I have corrected in your essay. Um, but please try to hand in a paper copy as soon as possible. Questions? If you have already handed in a paper copy, you can ignore this. All right, this is for late submissions only. Okay, for the rest of today, um, I suggest you begin thinking about what you want to write for your cause effect essay. Uh, I will give you the rest of this time to think about what you want to write. You can talk with your classmates, you can plan your essay, you can even begin writing your essay. And of course, if you have questions, I'm right here. <laughs>